Good morning. Thank you for joining us today, Thursday, September 17th, 2020, for our webinar entitled Equal Pay Act, Why Do We Still Need to Have This Conversation? Presented by Ethos Human Capital Solutions and Merhab Robinson and Clarkson Law Corporation. This is such an important topic, so we're really excited to have this presented today. This is Denise Ketty, and I am your moderator for this session. I want to go over a few housekeeping notes before I introduce today's expert panel. The webinar is being recorded and all attendees are in listen only mode. Our webinar will run approximately 60 minutes in total. Please take a moment now to visit the handout section on the GoToWebinar control panel. If you go down to the control panel, you can enable it so that you can see the handout section and you can download a copy of today's presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, please post them to the Q&A area on the dashboard at any time, and we will get to them as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Any questions that we don't get to, we will follow up with you at a later time. If you have issues during the presentation, you can email me directly at denisemketty at gmail.com. Just a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded and all accompanying materials are protected by copyright. The presentation today provides general information and does not constitute any legal advice. The information offered during this webinar is as of today, September 17, 2020. As always, we recommend that you consult with your own legal counsel to address any specific situation to ensure that you have the most up-to-date information on legal matters. One other thing I wanted to mention, if you are an HR practitioner and you are looking for HRCI credits for today's webinar, please make sure you write that HRCR credit in the Q&A and we'll get back to you on that after the webinar. Let me introduce you to our experts and our webinar hosts today. Our legal expert is Marla Murhab Robinson, partner and head of transactional department at Murhab Robinson and Clarkson. The firm's transactional department practices in the areas of corporate, mergers, acquisitions, real estate, finance, and employment law. Marla's reputation among her clients and peers is that she delivers personalized service and is responsive, reliable, and well-respected. Murhab Robinson and Clarkson is unique in that Marla and the other members of her firm have all worked in the corporate world. This experience means that her firm has unique understanding of the business challenges you face combined with the legal concerns your company is confronted with on a daily basis. Our human capital expert today is Linda Duffy, president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda and her team are known for building the magic of the human connection with the unique approach to HR consulting, training, and payroll support programs. The Ethos team works with your company by developing strategies for business leaders to get the right systems, people, and culture in place within your organization so that you, as a business owner, can focus on running your business and achieving your goals. Linda, can you introduce us to our guest presenter today? I can, Denise. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and just to, re just to uh, remind you what Denise just said, if you do have uh, HRCI accreditation and would like credit, we have submitted this for one hour of general recertification credit. So just type HRCI into uh, the question box and we will make sure to follow up with you after this. Um, I am super excited that Don Knepper is here with us today. Um, and I'm also really pleased to say that Don Knepper is founder and president of Knepper Law PC because that is brand new information in the last week. So congratulations, Don, on that. Um, we're really excited to have her here. Um, you'll see that when she presents, Don's really passionate about representing, protecting individual rights in the workplace with equal pay as the cornerstone of her practice. She also has represented employers for years. She has been on both sides of this table. Um, so she's represented clients on matters including alleged discrimination, harassment, retaliation, wrongful termination, uh, misappropriation of trade secrets, defamation, fraud, a whole host of different issues. So she is well versed in employment law. And what I really appreciate about her and why I reached out to her is because she has her own story here. She has firsthand knowledge of what it's like to sue her employer for an equal pay violation. So she will share some of that with us as well. Uh, Dawn is licensed both in California and Texas, and she serves on the Laguna Beach Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. Um, I know, Dawn, it has been a very busy couple of weeks for you. Um, so we are very happy um, 
and very thankful that you have joined us today. So I am going to turn it over to you and let you take it from here. Great. Thank you, Linda. Delighted to be here and delighted to be able to work with you and this uh, terrific team. Uh, it's really a, a very solid group of professionals and um, just really excited. And also Girl Power, right? So um, uh, as you indicated, uh, I do have a unique experience in the fact that um, I have had my own claim uh, for equal pay. And so this is a um, topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I do have a special passion of um, helping address the issues related to equal pay. And I, for the last uh, almost 20 years, have been working on the management side, trying to help uh, my clients, such as uh, Marla's and Linda's clients, uh, with addressing equal pay from the inside. Uh, but as Linda indicated uh, just a week ago, I quit my big firm job and have started my own firm, uh, Knepper Law, and I'm now going to be helping individuals pursue these kinds of claims. Um, the reason, again, as I indicated that I have my own uh, passion is the fact that I, I did have my own story. I worked at a national labor and employment firm for uh, over 12 years. Um, I came up through my career there. I had my two children while I was working there. And um, I felt that as I looked around through the years, I felt that there was a big uh, disparity in pay amongst myself and some of my male colleagues. And um, as you will hear me discuss through the presentation, while the numbers were very transparent and available, uh, what I think at the end in my heart made, made me believe that contributed to the disparity in pay was the lost opportunities that lots of times women lose for various different factors, including the fact that you know, we might take a step out of the workforce for some short window of time for having children, or we are a caregiver or we're doing various different things, uh, or sometimes it's the good old boys club, let's face it, that uh, may contribute where people want to uh, help others that are coming up through the ranks that look like them. Uh, but I did battle on in litigation for uh, two and a half years, and uh, I'm glad that that's behind me, but I definitely have uh, learned some lessons along the way, and definitely you know, am happy to help your clients I'll work through these issues so they can avoid it. Now, um, on this first slide, I had, um, I was just kind of curious, like what's in the news on equal pay? It's something I'm always watching uh, just because it's in my profession, but I was curious uh, what was out there. Um, you know, Linda, you were asking about my own personal story and I was remembering that when I started uh, my own personal case, um, equal pay was really big in the news on various different topics, whether it be the US women's soccer team or various industries in entertainment. One of the ones that really caught my eye at the time that I had filed my case, uh, I would have been watching the show The Crown on Netflix uh, related to the British monarchy. And I was really taken when I heard that the young woman, um, uh, Claire Foy, who uh, plays Queen Elizabeth herself, was being paid about $13,760 less an episode than the guy who played Prince Philip, her husband, uh, which I thought was really shocking when you think about who the story is about. Um, and that was a, a head, headline at that time back in 2018. Fast forward now, here we are in 2020, and despite you know what we're dealing with with the pandemic, um, there's still plenty of headlines out there on equal pay, and I put a couple up here just so we could see what's going on in the news right now, uh, one of the things that caught my attention is that there have been various states that have been following California's lead, amending their equal pay uh, legislation. And I noticed that Maryland is on the cusp of um, or, um, moving forward with their change to their legislation on equal pay. Um, another headline that I saw up there was related to uh, the soccer. You know, if you've been following the news, the U.S. women's uh, soccer team had filed a lawsuit related to the disparity in pay that they felt they were receiving versus the men's team. And in preparation for this, I was just kind of checking in today, seeing where we are with that case. And um, it actually did have a summary judgment granted against the player on a number of their different claims. And it's now gone up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So that fight continues. But interestingly, on a national level, uh, the precedent has been set by the U.S. women's team, where now other countries are making significant efforts to ensure that equal pay 
exists among uh, that league. I also thought it was interesting, too. I was looking um, with uh, tennis being on the news recently, and I saw that on the 2019 Forbes list of the highest paid athletes, um, does anyone want to take a guess on how many women actually made the list? 100 paid, highest paid athletes. Linda, you want to take a guess? I'm putting you on the spot. I don't know if she can hear me out there. I can. I'll tell sorry. you. I'm going to say, I'm going to say okay. four. Four. It's one. Uh, Serena, Serena Williams. Williams. <laughs> I was going to say new Serena for sure. Yeah. One. At okay. 63. Tied at number 63 with total earnings of $29 million. Um, but really shocking when I saw as to professional athletes, only one out of the highest paid athletes is a woman. Um, another headline that's out there right now uh, was a story about Suzanne Summers. Uh, do you remember how she disappeared from Three's Company? It turned out it was, uh, I was writing by myself, it was in the middle of the fifth season. It was back in 1980. And uh, she was recently profiled in biography, and she was talking about the reason uh, why she disappeared from the show was the fact that uh, she came to realize that John Ritter and some of the other men that were on the show were making 10 times what she was making. And uh, she went back to advocate for equal pay and the network fired her. Um, apparently at the time they felt that they had already had to pay too much for Laverne and Shirley who was coming out with their own series. Um, but that's another story that's in the headlines. Um, another story I saw there was uh, related to um, different groups. Um, last week was Equal Pay Day for African American women, uh, which means that it took all the way until that day in August for women to catch up with uh, white men in terms of pay. And then finally, I saw another interesting article on the impact of salaries in the pandemic. Um, this is related to South Korea, but it indicated there's been a study already done there about the uh, number of layoffs that are being impacted because of COVID-19 and the fact that it is uh, significantly already impacting women who already have uh, such a significant disparity in pay. It's uh, 32% um, women versus men on average in that country. So uh, just interesting what we're seeing out in the news. Now let's uh, switch and talk about uh, what we're seeing just on the landscape and perhaps what contributes to some of these factors that we're seeing out in the headlines. So, um, you know, quite often we hear about the shocking stories that are being addressed in the news, um, claims of sexual harassment, sexual assault, um, and some claims of equal pay, such as the women uh, with the U.S. soccer team, um, where they actually make the, the headlines and they are kind of the top of the iceberg, so to speak, that is sticking out above the waters. Um, but below that water is what, um, you know, many people say contributes to these overarching issues of why there are gender uh, issues and, and pay disparities. Um, and that uh, relates to people looking the other way when it comes to bad behavior, not really wanting to deal with it. Uh, comments about uh, women's bodies. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday, Linda, you'd appreciate this, I was doing a troika with someone. And uh, she was telling me how her daughter recently had uh, a male supervisor send her a text about getting a BJ. Um, and it's just shocking that, you know, young women are still receiving texts like that from their supervisors. Um, but it is happening. And it's comments like that, that, you know, she ended up just kind of putting up with it and moving on, uh, quitting her job. But that certainly contributes to people having a bad experience. and maybe not necessarily being willing to advocate for themselves in the workplace. Um, we also have situations where um, there's, you know, it's been said a culture of women being interrupted in the workplace. Uh, who's on the hiring committee uh, if it's all male? Uh, jokes about people taking time off from maternity leave. Um, and then other things like sexist language and uh, job postings. Um, I even know I participated, this was within my case, I was participating in a job interview, and um, one of my male colleagues had made a, uh, we were interviewing a male candidate, and one of my male colleagues made a joke during the interview about uh, how this male candidate, he had a lot of children, and how his wife must be very tolerant of his needs. Um, you know, again, just a kind of comment like that taking place in modern day in a job interview. Um, these are things that, you know, really do happen, and so they, 
Um, it's said that these contribute to some of the factors of why we continue to have this disparity in pay. Now, I wanted to talk about um, something that I actually uh, got on my radar in preparation for this uh, presentation. I had seen uh, something out kind of on the radar, but I didn't realize it was coming up so close, which is uh, here in California, Senate Bill 973. Uh, which now has been passed both by the California Assembly and the California Senate. And it will require private employers with 100 or more employees to submit their annual pay data to the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, the DFEH. And that's the department to which your employees would go and make a complaint of gender discrimination or um, equal pay. Um, he, uh, Governor Newsom has until September 30th to sign this bill. And it is said that he will sign it. So we should be seeing some movement on that in just the next couple of weeks. And it will take effect on January 1st, 2021. Now, what it will do when it passes is it will require employers to report the number of employees um, by race, ethnicity, and sex in various different job categories. It's akin to the reporting that is done on the EEO-1 form. And, um, this is something that apparently the Obama administration had said before um, he left office that they were going to undertake uh, on a national level to require employers to report this information uh, so it can ad address the equal pay issues. Um, but as we know, um, some of those you know, were, were went to the side uh, with the change in administration. But the California legislature has specifically said in its legislative findings that it feels that there are legitimate and lawful reasons in some instances for paying some employees more than others, but they do recognize that there is a discriminatory pay gap here in California. And so part of the reason why they have moved forward with this SB 973 is despite the fact that at the federal level that that pay reporting is not happening, but they're going to require it here in California. So this is really significant, Linda and Marla, for your clients uh, here in California that have over 100 employees. It's gonna be new requirements for next year. And so it gives more reason, uh, more than ever, to um, make sure that you're taking a careful look at your pay practices and making sure that there are no issues there that you're not aware of. Now, um, just a quick, hit on the agenda today and what we're going to be covering. So um, first off, I'm going to be giving some uh, facts on gender issues in today's workplace, uh, just a little bit more flavor to kind of give you a sense of um, what some studies are showing um, in the disparity in pay. Uh, then we will be talking about equal pay. What does it really mean? And in particular, we'll talk about the legal standard for equal pay. And I'm going to give you some specific examples from um, some real life cases um, so that you can have um, some exemplars to kind of help you understand some of these theories. And then finally, I'm going to conclude with some specific tips of what your company or firm can do uh, to make sure that you're in uh, compliance with the state requirements. So as I indicated, um, I just thought it would be helpful to go and start off with um, some discussion of gender equality at work. Now, um, I had given a presentation a couple of years ago, um, and actually have been consistently giving a presentation, but I've gone back to a presentation I did give back in 2018, because I had some great information from this group uh, called McKinsey & Co., and it's affiliated with the Lean In organization. And I came to find out that they, for the, for the last five years, have been completing a study um, on gender equality issues and trying to provide some insight to companies on um, how things are looking uh, based on the feedback that they're getting and asking companies to actually contribute to their study and also factors that exist uh, that um, contribute to the continued perpetuation of the disparity in pay and also um, indicating some bright spots. And so one bright spot um, that came on my radar, I noticed it on the news just last week, uh, was uh, an appointment of Jane Frazier. Uh, she was appointed to be the first woman to uh, lead a major U.S. bank. Uh, she was with Citibank for 16 years, and she will be taking over at the beginning of 2021 um, after her male colleague has retired. 
Uh, Ms. Frazier is 53 years old, and apparently she will not have any female counterparts among the largest U.S. banks when she come, takes over as the chief. But I thought what was very interesting, too, is that among the uh, Fortune, um, or I'm sorry, the S&P 500 stock index, there are only 31 women among the chief executives of those companies. Um, and based on some recent information I read just on um, Ms. Frazier and her story, it said that women account for 26% of all senior U.S. financial services executives in 2019, which is an increase of 6% from 2016. Um, but it is said that the uh, industry is still very much suffering with the disparity uh, with women at the top levels. Um, and interesting, uh, if you if you are you or your organization are interested in finding out more information on this uh, McKinsey and Co. study, um, they are actually releasing the result of their 2020 study on September 30th. So coming right up, and we'll get even more information and statistical information uh, than what I have up here on the slide. Now this. Um, this is actually from the introduction of the 2019 uh, McKinsey and Co. study. And as they indicated, five years in, uh, they've been seeing some bright spots at senior levels. Uh, but again, they recognize that companies need to focus their efforts earlier on the pipeline to make more progress. You know, at least for me, I've always said from my own personal story that sure, you know, there's a lot of women that are entering, um, you know, law firms. Uh, we're going in in a larger number. We're a larger number of graduates than we are of men going out of law school, going into law firms. But what's interesting uh, when you're someone like myself, a shareholder at a top-level national firm, is you start looking around and you realize that you know all your friends and peers that grown up with you through your career have now left for different reasons. And so I definitely think I at least can attest to um, what they're saying here is that efforts really are needed through the pipeline, you know, what is happening within organizations where they're losing women at those top levels um, so that it creates that disparity within representation. And this is just some statistical information that kind of uh, relates to what I was just referencing. Nearly 50% of law school graduates are female and almost 34% of attorneys nationally were women in 2013 and less than 19 are equity partners. And I can certainly um, say that I've experienced that. And uh, only 4% of the 200 top U.S. firms have female firm-wide managing partners, um, something, you know, I'm not used to saying, but excited that I can definitely say I'm, a, uh, I'm not a top U.S. firm yet, but um, I'm, I, I'm at least uh, Knepper Law solo uh, leading that charge. Now, uh, let's switch to uh, talk a little bit about um, Women of color, um, I, we've kind of gone through some of the statistical information. I think what's really interesting is also looking at women of color and uh, what we're seeing through the pipeline. Um, on uh, this next chart, there's uh, a sh uh, information here which shows uh, the disparity in terms of how people enter the workforce and then how it gets whittled down uh, over time where people um, progress throughout their careers. And so you can see, in particular, uh, the numbers are especially shrinking for um, women of color. Um, this is from some of the more recent statistics. This is a chart actually from this uh, 2019 study from McKinsey and Co. And some other statistical information I saw was that workers who are Hispanic, Hispanic Black, and American Indian have lower median earnings than women who are white or Asian. And then also over the course of a 40-year career, a Hispanic woman can expect on average to earn at least a million dollars less than a white man for the same work. Um, and then bigger disparities also exist for older workers, workers with disability, and also working parents. So let's talk about the legal standard of what is considered equal pay. Um, we all hear the terminology equal pay for equal work which is essentially that employees should be performing the same job, should be given the same pay. Now, there's different legal requirements, um, and for sake of not taking too much time in the presentation, I didn't want to go through the minutia of all of these laws, but these are the ones that would be applicable 
to uh, Linda, both yours and Marla's clients. Uh, so this would be the Equal Pay Act of 1963. Um, we also have Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We also have the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. And then, um, as I indicated earlier, I was talking about Maryland amending their law. Well, California amended its Equal Pay Act a few years back. And I would say that is definitely uh, the most onerous and stringent of the applicable laws that are up here on the slide. So um, I thought it would be most helpful to go through um, the particularities of the California Fair Pay Act itself. So the California Fair Pay Act prohibits disparity in pay based on gender, race, or ethnicity. So I recognize that um, many of the examples I've given um, throughout the presentation so far are largely related to gender. But I do want to make sure I reference the fact that we're not just only looking at gender. It is gender, race, or ethnicity. Um, and so you could also have people, let's say, uh, with dif within different colors. Um, let's say an African American population, uh, someone saying that they have darker skin and that they have um, uh, a lower rate of pay than African American employees who have lighter skin. Um, so that would be a claim that could be asserted under the California Fair Pay Act. Now, um, I will go into greater detail on this next point, uh, but I want to make sure um, I, I reference the fact that, that one of the biggest changes that came out of the California Fair Pay Act is that it compares substantially similar employees when viewed of composite skills, experience, and responsibilities. And so that is very different than the federal standard of similarly situated. And again, I'm going to give some examples on that, but it is something that is very significant for California employers that this is not an apples to apples anymore. And a lot of people are still operating under that misperception uh, um, but it, it is something that is substantially similar. And so I'm going to go into what that means, but that is a very significant criteria for businesses as they evaluate their pay practices. And it also uh, compares employees across different locations. Uh, Linda and I were talking this morning about a matter that she had worked on for a client and a disparity in pay between somebody in Las Vegas versus somebody in California. And so, of course, geography could be um, and an example um, that could be, or a, a criteria that could be utilized to um, set different pay. Um, and the California Fair Pay Act does take that into consideration. Now, uh, the California Fair Pay Act, um, the burden of proof is uh, rather, I'd say, uh, it's much more onerous for businesses than it is for the employee uh, when they make an assertion that they feel that there is uh, an equal pay issue. The employee only has to show that he or she is being paid less than the employee of the opposite sex, race, or ethnicity who is, again, performing substantially similar work. It's not that apples to apples. It's substantially similar. The employer then has the burden to show that it has legitimate reason for the pay difference. And part of what they can establish to escape liability is if they can establish with their um, and meet their burden of proof by showing that it is based on one of the various different factors. Uh, number one, they have a, a seniority system that has taken into account the differential in pay. Number two, they have a specific merit-based system uh, that explains it. Number three, that they have a system that measures earnings by quality or quantity of production. And then number four, which is the one that is relied upon the most by employers, which is showing that they have a bona fide factor other than the protected category that the employee has articulated, such as education, training, or experience. Now, prior salary, again, is not something that should be taken into consideration. Um, and hopefully your audience is aware of the restrictions as it relates to uh, hiring practices with uh, taking into consideration and asking someone about their, um, their, their current pay or prior pay at, at earlier employers, uh, because that is not permitted under California law and under many other state laws. So this kind of reflects uh, and it's consistent with uh, the other laws related to taking consideration um, earlier pay. Um, an employer can only take that into consideration as part of a factor 
when it can demonstrate that the factor is not based on or derived from sex, race, ethnicity-based differential and compensation, is job-related with respect to the position in question, and is consistent with business necessity. Now let's talk about what business necessity means. Under California law, it's been recognized to mean that it's an overriding legitimate business purpose such that the factor relied upon effectively fulfills the business purpose it is intended to serve. And it will not apply if the employee demonstrates uh, through the shifting burden of uh, making this kind of claim that an alternative business practice would serve the same purpose without producing the same wage differential. The employer also has to establish affirmatively that the factor relied upon was reasonably applied and the factor actually accounts for the entire wage differential. So Linda and I, in preparation for this presentation, we're talking about being able to account for the differential in pay down to the penny. And that is absolutely true because it is based on this legal standard that you have to demonstrate that you have reasonable factors that you have relied upon in setting your pay practices. And you've also advised your, your employees of how you set those pay practices. I want to give you an example of a case that you may have seen a few years ago. It was very high profile, and um, I think it was a big learning lesson for a lot of us. So do you remember the case related to Ellen Powell? Ellen Powell was the woman up in Silicon Valley that had made a claim against her employer, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers. And she um, was, this was covered very, um, very high in the, in the news at the time. Uh, because of the fact that she was making so much money and she was making this equal pay claim. And you may or may not remember seeing it in the news and the fact that it went all the way through trial. And in the end, Ellen Powell got poured out and uh, recovered nothing. And um, the, what I thought was really interesting is the fact that Ellen Powell's claim came before the amendments to the Equal Pay Act. And so um, the standards that I just gave you particularly as it relates to business necessity and also what is considered substantially similar, did not exist under the law as it was written at the time. So um, her case, even though it was based here in California, was largely tried under the uh, Title VII standard, the federal standard. And so as I indicated earlier on, the federal standard is not nearly as stringent as the uh, California standard. Now in her case, Ellen Powell had said, that um, she should be considered, to, uh, she was a junior partner, and she wanted to be uh, compared to some of her male counterparts who had been promoted over the course of time. Uh, she had sought promotion over a number of years, and uh, she was saying that she was denied certain opportunities and um, that she should be compared to those senior partners. However, um, within her trial under Title VII, um, it was determined that they were not an apples to apples comparison and therefore her case was not tried um, and, and that was not taken into consideration. And so I would say that was part of the reason, at least in my opinion, why Ellen Powell was not successful in her claims. However, to the extent that Ellen Powell's case had been tried under uh, California Fair Pay Act, I think it would have been a very different result because it would have allowed her to um, make the argument that she should be considered to those senior partners the positions that she sought and then she coveted over, over all those years uh, because I think that it meets the standard of what was considered substantially similar. And so again, um, I always tell people, it's not an apples to apples anymore. It's an apples to pluots, if you know what a pluot is. I don't even know what a pluot is, but that just tells you right there. It's different enough, but substantially similar enough where the two could be compared under the California Fair Pay Act, an employee can make an argument, and then it's up to the business to establish that it has identified reasonable criteria that it has advised its employees on, on how it sets its pay practices. Pretty significant, right? So, to the extent someone like Ellen Powell was successful now under the California Fair Pay Act, the damages are really significant. It allows for the recovery of what is considered the unpaid wages, which is the differential in pay that could be established, as well as interest, attorney's fees, a $10,000 penalty, 
and liquidated damages that are double the wages and interest. And you think about this, this is a four-year statute of limitations on some of these wage claims. Um, it could be very significant. It also prohibits retaliation against employees who uh, seek to enforce or assist in any manner enforcement of the California Fair Pay Act and question their pay. Now, other provisions that are noteworthy is employers are required to keep records of wages, their wage rates, and the job classifications and other terms and conditions of employment for three years. Um, previously, prior to the amendment, the record requirement was only two years. So make sure uh, you're maintaining those records. So if you ever do have an employee who makes a claim, you have the documentation that you need. Now, all right, so we've talked about the legal standard. Um, let's talk about what you can actually do to uh, tackle the issue to the extent you're concerned that you have an issue, or maybe you're not even sure you have an issue. But if you're calling into this webinar, you're educated enough that perhaps you should go and just take a step and, and take a big picture look and see whether or not there are possible pay disparities. Uh, so the first thing I would say is that you can't assess individual or group disparities again, as being just because of the fact that they're nearly identical. Remember, uh, California um, allows an examination of uh, substantially similar. <laughs> Tally, sorry, everybody. There you go, Linda, there's your, your, your bing. Okay, and then uh, the next thing that needs to be taken into consideration is the normalizing and leveling of positions to um, create an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Remember that that is a very complex and Imprice, uh, imprecise, imprecise uh, as well as a difficult situation to try and replicate. Um, so I don't think it, it makes sense to necessarily sit down and compare positions one exactly for the other. Um, I have a matter I'm working on for someone right now where they saw a position that was recently morphed to someone who had left the company and they had had a very similar position uh, or the, the same position as uh, a woman and she saw that her male colleague left and um, that the company had posted something on LinkedIn, but they had slightly changed the job. Uh, but the job advertising on LinkedIn uh, was advertising the position for more than what she's getting paid. And she's been with the company a long time. So she's kind of like, hmm. So that would be an example of, um, again, you can't just look at it apples to apples because your employees aren't going to. Uh, let's see here. And I would say that we've got some other points up here on the slide, but the big point here is it's better to fix the issues that lead to pay gaps versus um, trying to measure the little disparities one for one. So uh, let's talk about some additional ideas of what we can do to uh, fix the root causes of the pay gaps. So it starts all the way at the beginning with recruitment. Um, take a look at the way your organization does recruitment. Um, do your events have a subtle turnoffs to certain sectors of, um, of uh, the workforce? As an example, I'm a member of uh, an organization that I recently joined uh, related to marketing, and I was finding that a lot of their meetings were only uh, really early in the morning. And as a, a parent of young children, that put me in a really difficult position of being able to participate in those kinds of events. So likewise, if your company is doing something like that, would it be isolating out a segment of the workforce because of the way that the event is being managed? Um, also take a look uh, within the recruitment of who makes up the pool that's participating. Is it, is it the kind of uh, blended group that you'd like to be able to see um, as, again, part of that pipeline within the coming into your organization? Um, Give some consideration on how you encourage diverse groups and women to apply to your organization. Um, where are you posting these jobs? Um, are there different ways that you can um, maybe level it out? Let's say, is there a professional organization uh, for a certain segment of the population uh, that you might be able to list job postings with that you hadn't done before? Um, making sure that you have eyes on it from various different pr perspectives. Also give some consideration on who serves on your interview committees within your organization. Make sure that it's a diverse uh, set of people who are asking those questions of people and candidates uh, for your organization. And then think about whether or not your interviewers um, are maybe saying things uh, that 
could uh, create an, or deal with their personal unconscious bias. Um, I would say that that is a really hot topic um, in today's day and age, especially in the wake of the Black Lives Movement, is um, taking a look at you know, what are our internal unconscious biases? And I think that really takes us back to, again, the beginning of the recruitment process uh, when we're, when we're um, bringing in people within our organization. Now, within uh, hiring, do you give people an opportunity to negotiate? And take a look at who's negotiating. Um, I personally spoke to a women's organization recently, and the whole point of my presentation was to talk about um, putting forward your best ask, so to speak. And uh, as part of this presentation, um, all the participants were actually able to put in a chat box, um, introduce themselves to me as I was speaking. And I was really taken in all the introductions, how many of the people were uh, young women who were very entry level within their respective organizations, and how many of them said that they were scared to ask because they were scared as to how they would be perceived if they asked or pushed for more money. Uh, now, remember, California actually doesn't allow you to ask as it relates to pay history. And in fact, a candidate has a right to ask you uh, for um, a salary range. And you have an obligation as an organization to provide that. And maybe as to assist people in that negotiation, maybe even consider giving that range up front. Um, also, take a look within your hiring practice to see if there's groups of people that are perhaps declined more than others. Now, um, at the next step, we're looking at opportunities within an organization. These are current employees. Um, who is given the best and most coveted projects and clients? Um, I know even something that was significant in my personal case was about marketing dollars. You know, certain um, you know, law firms give people a pool of money, um, a budget with which to work on. Um, but you know, mine was amorphous, at least as it related to the circumstance I was working in. And when I actually you know, sat down and started looking, I found out that my male colleagues were getting two, three, four times more money uh, than I was getting for marketing and participating in things like golf tournaments or even using the money to support their kids, you know, soccer leagues. Um, but that was their way of getting their names out there um, and opportunities that I didn't feel like I was being given. And I think that is a significant factor um, that really could put um, certain segments of your workforce behind. Are there uh, pregnant women that are losing uh, the same access? You know, Linda, it's interesting. I've only uh, been operating my firm today as day five, and I already have two pregnancy discrimination cases. Um, really surprised um, with that. And I just um, already seeing that, you know, pregnant women aren't feeling that they're getting the same kind of access when they inform their employers that they are pregnant. Um, let's see here. Uh, when people retire, uh, what happens when uh, that work is passed forward? Uh, that, that, again, was a big factor in my case. Um, you know, how is it institutionally work paved forward? You know, uh, it's all about relationships and whatever organization that, you know, you work in. And how are those uh, relationships translated to the next person in line within the organization? And are people actually making a, a concerted effort to make sure that those relationships are passed on to a diverse group of people within your organization. Um, do men and women take on separate kinds of projects and internal initiatives, or is it a blended group? Uh, then you can also look to promotional opportunities. Uh, what are the rates of promotion for various groups? Um, do, maybe you have a problem there when you see, again, uh, the pipeline we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. I showed that slide from McKenzie where it shows we're all coming in equal, but what's happening as people will progress within their um, positions within your organization, and are you taking efforts to ensure that those people keep moving along? Um, is there a disparity in raises that are earned? That's a pretty easy one right there. Also bonuses, that's an easy factor that you can look to uh, to see if there is a, an issue with pay gaps. Um, the managers see data on promotion rates. You know, that's something that, again, for larger organizations, uh, we're going to have to start publishing, uh, it looks like, uh, starting in 2021 for California employers. Are there prominent women leaders within your organization? If not, you know, what efforts has your business taken to ensure that there are women that uh, lead the way for the young women within your organization? And then uh, are there differences in what people consider to be the superior performance? Um, is there something that, you know, allow people to maybe see a certain segment of your um, 
population at the workplace in a higher light than others. Um, take a look at your parental policies. Um, do you have a program to help people as they onboard and offboard for uh, leaves of various different kinds? You know, um, I was speaking with a former colleague of mine yesterday, and he's a defense employment attorney, and he was telling me he really feels that that really is something we're going to start seeing more out of COVID-19 is men making claims of a disparity in uh, leave practices because men are having to take a step up, um, particularly with what's been happening in the workforce right now. Uh, do women progress at the same rate after having a baby or do men? Again, uh, because that could likewise be a similar issue. Um, are deliverers, deliverables being emphasized over FaceTime? And yeah, that's an interesting point here, especially as we're all working virtually. Um, are we making sure that people who are having to work remotely because they have their kids at home, that they're having, again, same or similar opportunities? And then um, also take a look next at your culture. Um, who are the top uh, evangelists, so to speak, within your organization? Uh, who gets the airtime? Uh, who, who is the, the brightest star and light within your organization? And what kind of image are they setting for your organization and the people coming up under there? Um, is there a potential hostile work environment or quid pro quo culture uh, that can contribute to some issues? And then also, are there uh, subtle practitioners of on-the-edge behavior uh, where people feel that they're on the edge based on the management practices of certain managers? I was just retained yesterday on another case related to a woman who told me that um, hostilities had gotten so high at her workplace um, that two of the owners broke out in a freaking site where the police had to be called in and uh, this woman uh, when one of the owners was reaching for the telephone he shoved her to the floor because he was trying to reach to her phone and she ended up having a seizure um, so you know things are really weird right now in the workplace and you have to look at the way your um, culture is being led uh, by the leaders within your organization and what kind of precedent that they are setting and then um, finally, as to retention, are certain groups leading more than others? Again, I indicated that's been something I've noticed through the course of my career is uh, different women falling out. And then um, if, if it is an issue, are you asking questions about it within exit interviews? So hey, on this next slide. Sorry, yeah. Don. I just wanted to give you a heads up that um, uh, I'm watching the time for us, and we've just got a couple minutes if you can wrap up pretty quickly. So I just want to make sure we have time for questions. Sure. And that's what I was just about to say was that Perfect. I have some example starting solutions up on this next slide. And I really kind of just gone through this um, as I went through the different criteria. But to the extent that you're looking for some more uh, tips or specific practices that you can take away from this presentation as you evaluate your pay practices, uh, these are all things that kind of build off of everything from the recruitment through the retention practices within your organization that you can take into consideration. And then um, finally, let's talk about um, sustaining uh, real uh, change within your organization. You know, don't just uh, send out an email and tell people that they need to do something differently now. It's really coming up with specific expected behaviors um, and specific guidance that you can provide for all groups. And to the extent that you are making changes, um, communication is key. I highly recommend that you work with a professional um, if you feel that you do have an issue, whether it's someone um, in an HR capacity like Linda or legal counsel uh, like Marla or even other um, pay experts that we could introduce uh, you to to the extent, again, you, you feel that you have an issue within your organization. Uh, but the biggest thing is coming up with some specific uh, criteria that you can have as a takeaway uh, to make real change to the extent that you feel that you have a problem within your organization. So with that, um, we are wrapped up, Linda. Perfect. And Denise was, is going to jump in with some questions. Yeah, that was great and informative and um, just so, so enlightening on so many levels. A um, couple of questions that have come in. Uh, you mentioned, and I believe, and I, I might not have written this down correctly, but I believe you mentioned it was SB 973 um, getting potentially signed into law at the end of this month. What should we do to prepare for this, these new reporting requirements in California so that it will be going to effect next year if they're 
going to be signed in? I would say work with um, an HR professional uh, like Linda to make sure that if you haven't, you know, you've, you've had to do uh, certain reporting EEO1s uh, for years. And this is an additional layer of um, detail that's going to have to be reported. Um, Linda, do you mind um, speaking to what you do to help your clients with um, those kind of uh, reporting uh, mechanisms? Yeah, most of our clients have fewer than 100 employees, Don. So thankfully, we don't have that requirement. That's first and foremost. Um, but for those that do have over 100, we can certainly give them some guidance on the best way to do that. Um, I would say, you know, take a quick pass right now. Um, sort of go back to the slides that Don has. Take a quick pass at those the ideas that she had. Um, take a look at your pay practices, make sure that things seem in alignment. Like you can do a quick report out of your HRIS system and sort by job title and um, you know age, race, and gender, things like that to see if there's anything that jumps out at you uh, as being disparate and then ask yourself, is there a legitimate reason for this? I was saying to Dawn earlier today that we started including in our handbooks when we write those for clients, a compensation philosophy to lay out, we pay based on all of these factors because of that one client that I had that got sued by the EEOC uh, for paying, you know, based on geography, and the EEOC officer basically said, yeah, but you didn't say that anywhere in your policies. So you learn things the hard way, so now we make sure that they say things like that in their policies. Okay. But as to SB 973, uh, I would say uh, just familiarize yourself with the uh, particular categories that are going to have to be reported. Um, and start, um, you know, working with an HR team, um, whoever you, you know, you've probably been doing the federal EEO one form, and uh, look at the expanded criteria and the additional information that's going to have to be reported. It does say that employers will have to count individuals in these groups by looking at a single pay period of their choosing between October 1 and December 30th of the calendar year preceding March 31. So this year. Hi, this is Marla. I just want to yes. chime in on this. Um, as Linda said, most of our clients as well are less than 100, so thank goodness we don't have that extra reporting requirement, which seems like we have enough to do. But the first thing I would do, uh, and I think that this just echoes what was already said, is Look within. We got to look at what 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 have we, what do we have currently? What are, what do we have currently as everyone's pay and why? And then after that, start the policies. Let's let's what policies do we want? And then communicate those policies. And uh, of course, the handbook's a great place to start. Um, and then put in place. Oh my gosh, the suggestions have just been fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Um, we did have another question, and it related to the uh, SB 973 about um, can, since California employees cannot request or ask employees to identify themselves by gender or sex, how can they accurately report wages based on gender or sex? Will it be the same as the EOC categories? So I think you just mentioned that there's information that you can go and find out what's in the bill, Dawn? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. and I would say, so I don't yeah, think that I don't, Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I don't think that I would agree with that statement, though, that you can't ask. I think that you can ask a whole bunch of questions when somebody's hired that you can't ask before they're hired. Um, you would want to keep the information confidential, but you already, if you're over 100 employees, you already have a requirement to report, um, <clears throat> report different um, demographic information when you fill out the EEO-1. So unless I miss something in that question, I would say, yeah, you absolutely can. Just don't have them fill out a form identifying, you know, a whole bunch of information and then put it someplace publicly or, you know, I would just put it in a separate folder, put it, you know, someplace like with I-9s or something where only relatively few people can see it. Now, I don't know if she's asking um, or he is asking um, as it relates to the gender reporting. Is that what that, because I can't see it, Denise. Uh, is that what they're asking? Yeah. Yeah, they're, I okay. think they're what they're trying to find out is just to make a guess on what categories are, are going to be in that, um, yeah, in that so bill. But I think. Um, I got, I remember, I, I, this was in one of my presentations I did like last year, year before last, but 
because um, I don't regularly talk on the EO1 reporting, but I do remember that there there was uh, this new category that was provided where you have employees who don't self-identify by gender. Exactly. And so I'm guessing the state of California is going to have something similar within its reporting mechanism. Right, and that's what I was going to say, Don. Is that I I wouldn't put out just the choice male or female. You could put out, you know, um, you could put out non-binary. You could put out whatever. You're going to have to wait and see the report itself and what blanks you have to fill in to to put that information together. That information, right? So I wouldn't necessarily rush out right now and start asking people to identify as gender until you know what the choices are that California is going to give you. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, we also had another question when you were talking about um, the California Pay Act um, for a family-owned business. So say a family-owned business um, hires a member of their family, which we are, have all worked in these kind of uh, yeah. businesses. Um, is that discrimination if they pay the family member more than someone doing an equal job, or is that a reasonable differentiator? Yeah, that's an excellent, interesting question. I was actually retained by someone this year um, who, it was a family business, and it had been started by um, the wife, and then the husband came in, and he was actually performing the large majority of work, and um, they since have separated and are in the process of getting divorced, and he came to me and wanted to make an equal pay claim. Uh, because of the fact that um, his wife had set his compensation so much lower than his, even though he had uh, much greater job duties and responsibilities. And so I thought that was really interesting. It sounds like that's kind of on par with the question that you know your 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 audience member has asked. And so I would say yes, as long as um, I have to remind myself the the size of businesses for um, the California Fair Pay Act, and um, I'll look that up really quick. Because uh, there's thresholds of the number of employees that it applies to, um, but as long as you fall within that purview, I would say yes. There's always the possibility um, that someone could make a claim, even if it's a family-related organization. Interesting. Marla, Marla, are um, you still on the call? Hold on, one second, Denise. Mar Marla, are you still on the call? Because yeah. I'm wondering what your take is on that. Is she there? I knew she had a client coming up, so maybe she had to jump off. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions, Denise? We're coming right up on time. Why don't you, I know. Um, there's a couple more, but if we don't get to them, we get back. I think you had one, Linda, that you had uh, read about the. Um, you had one on your mind. That's affirmative okay. action. You could, you could skip it. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, is the new rule in March 2021 for California only or for all states on corporate payroll accounting? Or, or, or excuse me, our corporate payroll accounting is located in, in New Jersey and they're, it's a, they're a multi-state company. So I guess the, the, we're talking back again to the SB 973. Is that just for California or is it for all states? I'm assuming it's just California. That's just California. Now, okay. where the company is headquartered, I'm assuming that's just employees that are located in the state of California. If your person wants yeah. to shoot me a note, I can double check that, but I'm, that's my, my guess. Okay, we'll get that. And by um, the way, I asked, back to my question on the California Fair, Fair Pay Act and number of employees, I think it follows um, FIHA, which is five employees. Okay. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I think we have one more question that we can try to get to. Can you provide examples on addressing issues that fall under the federal level as you gave for California? Maybe it wasn't very specific. That question was well, I don't because... think that there's, I mean, a California, or a, I had it in the slide, the terminology, but they don't, uh, I think it's, let's see here. Look back at mine. Slide, the legal standard was different um, because California, again, is substantially similar uh, versus the language in the Equal Pay Act and Title VII um, uses the terminology similarly situated. So it's a different standard. So it's it's less onerous for businesses. And employees would have the choice, right, whether they file under federal law or file under state law. 
Yeah, but I mean, let's face it, if you're located in California, it'd be malpractice for a plaintiff's lawyer to make a claim under federal law versus state. Exactly. That's <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. why yeah. It's not I'm that an anomaly with all different. my experience before the EOC, because no one goes before the EOC here, right? you know? Yeah, um, it's, you go, it's not about that. It's not about the, the, there's not a difference in the type of claim, it's a difference in the standard, as it is with right. harassment and with everything else, right? It's it's the 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 benefit to the employee is so much greater in California. Yep, absolutely. So for the person that asked about uh, like the multi-employer state, that might be where they have to file federally, something like that. I mean, that's what happened with my client true. because they had, they're based here, but the employee was in Las Vegas. So that might've been the reason they filed with the EEOC as opposed to the Department of Fair Employment Housing, I don't know. But if somebody has more questions Great. on the federal level, something more specific, just follow up with me and I'll, I'd be happy to provide you some additional guidance. And your information is up on the screen. So if anybody wants to follow up directly with Dawn, you have her information right there. Lindy, do you want to close us out? Sure. I really want to thank you, Dawn. I learned a lot too. Um, and I know Marla's been on here and has enjoyed it as well. So thank you again so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise with us. I really want to encourage everybody to reach out to Dawn. If you have questions about equal pay, she is the expert. She has been on both sides of this table, so she can help you from either side. Um, I really appreciate everybody uh, joining us today, and we will be back in touch soon as soon as we schedule our next webinar. So thanks and make okay, it a great rest good. of the week. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.